Welcome to Rising Woman Leaders, a safe space for women to thrive in community where their voices and stories are heard. We're a sisterhood supporting each other to live our dreams and embody the sacred feminine to restore balance on our planet. Join us each week as we return to the unconditional love and guidance of our heart and our womb. I'm your host, Meredith Rom, and I invite you to walk this path of beauty, devotion, and service with us. here today with Jane Mayer, who is a voice and channel for the heart of the Holy One. A decades-long journey through the hallways of darkness and separation led her back into the light of presence and union. And she now offers multidimensional guidance and song for those who long to remember their true selves. She gives thanks to the indigenous wisdom keepers of the Andes, Amazon, British Isles, and Hawaiian Islands, alongside countless teachers bridging their medicine back to the Western world for their unending presence as she remembered the pathway home, to listen to her music, poetry, and musings, or to connect about mentorship, visit her website, janeislistening.com. Well, thanks for being here, Jane. Thank you so much for having me. This is such a pleasure. Mm. Yeah, so Jane and I have a few mutual friends, and one of them being Faye, who's been on our podcast before, giving all of her Magdalene wisdom. And Faye has a podcast. I was listening to her conversation with Jane there probably about a year ago, and um, I was actually building a sauna with my partner because I, like, received this guidance of... uh, I was really wanting to connect with my ancestral lineage and I knew I had some Scandinavian and Slovenian. And one of the things my ancestors would do in Minnesota was um, be in the sauna and be in that. That was like a ritual that felt like I wanted to connect with because I've always loved ritual and I've participated in ritual of many different cultures. And so the guidance came in of like, wow, build one and it was shelter in place and I had already started putting things into place for it and um so I was out there and I loved it I loved being outside getting away from the computer and I was learning to use a power saw and all of those things <laughs> and often I would listen to Faye's podcast and um your conversation came up at that time and just really stayed with me um in particular when you sang It was just like such a deep, like you said in your bio, like remembrance of the songs. And you told a story about Magdalene and Yeshua being with you in a ceremony. And then the song came through. So I just want to start off thanking you for that. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my goodness. That makes my heart so happy to to have been the conduit for you to receive their frequency, even if just for a moment. And so just, yeah, just really happy that that's that song sang to you. (laughs) Thank you. Yeah. So I would love to start with just going back into your journey of awakening and what really was the catalyst for you to start to change everything and really listen. And, um, you know, it's interesting. I remember when your Instagram, Jane is listening and your website, Jane is listening. And I'm like, I wonder, I want to ask her about this listening. <laughs> and then I was going through your website and uh, <clears throat> came across some of your writings. And if it's okay with you, I wonder if I could read something out loud. This may have been from a long time ago. I don't know. Oh my goodness. Of course. What? Like, okay. oh, I'm so excited. <laughs> Last from the past. Okay. Mm-hmm. So this really struck me and I wanted to ask you about it, but um, every time we work too hard, too long against the wills of our bodies, they give us messages. Every time we spend time with someone who drains us, the voice cries out. Every time we make a commitment because we want to please someone at the expense of our integrity, the internal voices are shouting. 
But beyond the expectations and conditioning of the world in which we love, there is a deeper reason we refuse to listen. We're afraid of what we might hear. We're scared that our lives might be a scam, that our relationships might be over, that our jobs are soul-sucking, that all our efforts at accomplishing are superfluous. And guess what? They might be. And at this time you wrote, two and a half years ago, I wasn't listening either. My body and soul were screaming at me so loudly that everyone around me could hear the voices but me. I was unhappily married, struggling with an autoimmune disease, and just coming off a failed round of in vitro fertilization. I was crying, raging, and in deep, deep grief and paralysis. My soul was screaming at me. It wanted me to change everything. In the face of such a request, is it any wonder I didn't want to listen? (laughs) Um, I'll pause there. There's a little bit more I'd like to bring in maybe later, but how is it to hear that? Thank you. Thank you for doing that. I needed to hear my own voice today. Um, It is tender to hear that. It is humbling to hear that. It is an affirmation of the path that I chose at that time in my life. And um, it just reminds me also, Meredith, that the journey does not end, you know, and I'm sure at that time in my life, I really thought that making the changes necessary, which was probably almost six years ago now, Um, would be the end. (laughs) And it's not, it was just the very beginning, you know, so I have so much, like when I look back at that person who I was, who made all those decisions that you just shared about, I have so much respect for her. And so just in awe of the courage it took to really make that first leap. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's really powerful to be in that place. What helped you start listening? I wish I could say that it was from some level of merit, (laughs) although it may have been from some other incarnation. But honestly, I was in so much pain. And I was just everywhere in my life that I was turning. I just kept getting met with brick walls. And, you know, I was married at the time, as I shared in that writing, and really unhappily, unhappily married and struggling to conceive a child and was coming up against myself in all of these different ways. And just knowing that everything wasn't working. And it was really the benevolence of this universe that I went through. I ended up going through IVF at that time. And there was like a 0.003% chance that what happened actually happened. I remember getting the call from the fertility doctor the day before Christmas in, I think, 2015. And um, in that moment when I received the phone call that what had unfolded had unfolded, which is that none of the eggs had fertilized. And it was such an astronomically small chance. My entire world just went black. And I fell into a hole that I didn't even know existed. And I just remember thinking at that time, everything I ever thought my life was going to be will not be. And I have to let go. So it was really just a result of life saying to me, this is not your path. And me actually choosing to surrender and die rather than keep fighting. Mm. Wow. That's a huge piece, like letting go of the future and what you had imagined motherhood. You know, do you feel like, yeah, like it was just happening the way it was because life was trying to tell you like, you're a healer, you're a medicine woman, please listen, like move beyond. I know. It's our moments of pain that really catalyze us. And I know some women who've had miscarriages and it's like 
that pain and that loss and that grief sometimes is what brings them on a spiritual path or like what like were you on a spiritual path before that or just did everything change you know i um i was on a spiritual path but it looked really different after that moment in my life i um about five years before that moment, maybe six years before that moment, I had hit another dead end in my road, which is that I um, had been a drug addict and an alcoholic, very high functioning or what would have been perceived as high functioning to a lot of people, what was deeply not high functioning. And I, I, um, I had another moment similar to that where I just, my entire life kind of died in front of my eyes. And I actually had to make the decision to live that I, I saw the tr- the life path that I was on with drugs and alcohol. And so in 2009, I got sober and of course the whole life I was living died and everything that I had been living inside of the relationships and the work and the city and that whole life died too. And so once I got sober, so much of my life was um, originally based in the spirituality of 12 step programs and what it looks like to show up and learn how to live a life without drugs and alcohol. But Mm -hmm. in, in 2015, when I went through this IVF and eventual divorce, um, yeah, that was the second, that was the second big death. And that opened up a level of spirituality that I could never have anticipated. Wow. Such a big journey. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And maybe I'll just share this other piece you shared about the indigenous cultures, which is on, on personal and societal levels, our ability to thrive hinges on whether or not we commit to deeply listening I fully believe that this is the frontier of our generation. Indigenous peoples around the world are masterful at these practices, and as a result, they live harmoniously with nature, avoid many of the modern nervous system diseases of the West, and maintain healthy communities. In fact, many Indigenous wisdom keepers believe that all mental illness is a result of soul sickness, of disconnection from our inner voices. So, yeah, anything you want to share about that? (laughs) Oh, my goodness. I could talk about the gifts I have been given from Indigenous cultures for the rest of this life, and it truly would never be enough, you know. Mm -hmm. I um, My my journey took me initially into, yeah, down to Peru. And once I went through everything that I had been through with divorce and IVF and had started work mentoring and working with a, um, a shaman in Los Angeles who had been trained by some of the native um, first nations of this country, I found myself in Peru um, working with plant medicines and you know, it's really interesting to look back of where I was because in time, it wasn't that long ago that I started that journey, but it was so many incarnations of Jane ago. So much I didn't know about who I was and what it meant to be a human being on earth. And the generosity, like the generosity of which I was cared for and supported and given wisdom and loved um, by, you know, by the Shipibo people and by the, the Quechua people and the Caro and, and as my journeys continued by keepers of wisdom in Hawaii and other places, it's just, it's really astounding. And it's even more astounding to think that, you know, given the reality of what we're all transmuting with the patriarchy and the karyarchy and all of these things that deeply affect them, that there's still that level of generosity that's given to, to us. So I'm just so grateful. Yeah. I really feel that being in Hawaii these past few months, it's like the love and the aloha that the people carry, even though I know there's been so much trauma and so much has been taken and it's such a, 
a teaching to see the love that, yeah, that is still there. Um, so when you, well, what would you say when you like gave your life to God or like when you really started surrendering, um, how did things change? And just, you know, it sounds like you were led on journeys of travels and anything else you want to share of just like how you were guided when you really started to make that shift. The first part of, of the journey um, really did include letting go of a lot of relationship and letting go of my marriage and letting go of staying in Los Angeles and letting go of the work I was doing and choosing at that time to follow the call to learn. You know, I, I felt this feeling that I still feel today and I think will follow me for the rest of my life, which is something is seeking you that which you're seeking is also seeking you. And wherever it appears, you know, there's this invitation to follow it. And for me at, at that time, the invitation was to travel, to, to educate myself and to learn about spiritual traditions from different cultures and to, to really meet the land and the keepers of those wisdom. And as, as the journey continued, um, oh man, it's just so humbling. I know, you know, it just never ends what it asks of us, right? Um, after I had committed myself enough to working with plant medicines in Peru, um, the mystery really began to ask me to heal my, my family lineage and my childhood trauma and to go back and start speaking the truth about what had happened to me as a child. And, you know, in, in the course of working with plant medicines and recovering and reclaiming memories and somatic experiences and actually remembering that I had experienced and witnessed sexual abuse as a child inside my family um, with a neighbor and just all of these pieces, you know, what the mystery continues to reveal to me because it's part of my own personal gift in the world is where I'm cut off from my voice and my creativity. So all of these places that I was fragmented from speaking truth and all of the places I was fragmented from running the creative life force through my body had to be faced and they had to be looked at and they had to be named and they had to be brought back into the body. So, you know, in the past years of my life, it's been about continuing to find all of these places where I'm not living from wholeness and meeting each one and bringing them back in. Um, and it just, you know, it continues. But at that time, it really was about the journey of traveling and and surrendering to wisdom and lineages that I could never have met um, growing up as a, a white girl in the deep South of the United States. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so much of why we did incarnate, a big piece of it is healing the ancestral lines and thinking, okay, I that willingness to do that work and that healing on behalf of our families and to be in that clearing for, I think about future generations and them coming in and, you know, how much work they'll be able to get done without having to focus on all that first. So <laughs> it's such a service, <laughs> um, but I mean, do you think it, do you think it does get to a point where you're like, where it's clear? Or do you feel like it's just <laughs> always, there's always more? <laughs> That's the question I, I go back and forth with all the time. And I, where I've actually like just recently in the past few weeks of uh, stopped thinking about using the word healing because it is a never ending journey, right? We can choose to continue to evolve. I mean, I'm here, you're here, so many of us listening to this podcast, we're here for generations of this change in the regime, the change in the guard on this planet. 
this is multiple incarnations of work that we're in the middle of right now. And Mm -hmm. I'll say this, like one of my, one of my absolute favorite scenes in any movie everywhere that has touched me so deeply was a scene from star Wars. (laughs) And it was in one of the movies in the past few years where there's this whole battle that's happening because we're trying to get princess Leia a flash drive of information And I think of that scene all the time of all of these people showing up, doing all this work so that the flash drive of information gets sent to the future generations Mm. of which ostensibly we won't be, except we probably will be reincarnating to actually receive the flash drive, right? And so the evolution continues. I think I've made a lot of peace with the reality that I am coming close to or have healed most of the initial trauma, the initial wounding of incarnating into this body um, and this time with this family. But, you know, our, our potential as human beings is limitless. So it's kind of like, how far do you want to go at this point? Yeah. And a lot of times when through the service, it's like we're continuing to to clear. And I also think as we're ascending, healing is going to look different. Like I feel like it's going to start accelerating and be faster and not as not take as much of of us. Um, I met a man here in Kauai who he holds space for people to come and lay down in his crystal temple that he built mm. and he invites us to call in our guides. And, and basically what he says is like, when we open to the higher support of these realms and give them permission to work on us on that subconscious level and to start to clear, it's like, it can almost start happening behind the scenes and, that was really new for me of like, oh, wow, maybe we are like entering into whatever that may be, 5D consciousness that we're starting to move towards and where healing looks different. And um, that's yeah. powerful. I think so. And I absolutely call that in. <laughs> yeah. I think, um, you know, I was saying that, you know, one of the things I notice in a lot of the women that I work with and and the men too, um, is, you know, I've spent years creating these like blueprints for healing. Like, okay, this was my pathway. I know this particular pathway works. This is what you do when you get to this place. This is what you do if you get to this place. You're like building this map for people. And what took me five years or two years to move through, then I just give that to someone and it's already completed and they can move through it so much faster. And so I really, I think that's a lot of what we're doing is, you know, some of us are doing the hard work on this one so that we can give that blueprint to other people. And some of the other ones are doing hard work on certain blueprints so we can give it to other people. And by the time my nephew, who's four years old, is an adult, it's going to be so much easier. We're just doing all that like deep, hard, dark clearing work. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Mm. Well, I wanted to ask you more about your journey with the voice. And I know this is something you've been teaching about. So what does the voice, like, what does it mean to you, us being in our voices? And why is it important? And then how did you come to really be in your voice? Was it, mm. you know, singing and speaking and anything else? But was that easy for you? Like, or it was, there was a journey there, I imagine. Mm. Yeah, so hard, not easy. <laughs> mm-hmm. So hard. Um, so as a little girl, I was a, I was just naturally a singer and a speaker and a storyteller. And I really come by it naturally. I think it, it runs my grandmother on my father's side and my aunt on my father's side are singers and songstresses and choralists. And then my grandmother, um, on my mother's side is a, was a storyteller, just this like really powerful keeper of stories. And so it, it's definitely something that lives inside me. And, but what happened as a result of the experiences I had as a child were that voice got completely shut down from the experience of trauma. And so 
I have found in my journey that reclaiming the voice is this consistent um, awareness in, in two pathways. One being, am I willing to show up and speak honestly and truthfully in my everyday waking life, in my intimate relationships with the people I work with, um, to the person standing in front of me at line? Any place that I am living from the voice that is not telling the truth, that is manipulative, that is controlling, any place I'm allowing my Akashic throat portal to be used for anything other than truth means I'm also cut off from the multidimensional gifts of the voice, right? So it's like living in that very everyday 3D reality of integrity with the voice and then also for me, the more I've awakened to my own true nature, the more that voice, that inner voice, the holy voice is, is what wants to speak and what wants to share. And so for me, that's looked like going back and reclaiming my initial gifts as a child, which was to be a singer and to be a, a sounder and a poet. And um, so it's been both. And I also really want to share that in the reclaiming of the voice, I am, I owe great, great, you know, honor to the Shipibo people who are the keepers of the ayahuasca traditions in the Amazon. And I'll share with you why. And it's, I'm sure on a very deep level, it's why my soul was drawn to learn from them and with them which is that when you're working with the lineages, um, the Shipibo people in Peru, they, the way they work to heal is through songs, these songs they call Icaros. And so when there's an act of healing, an act of reholing that occurs inside the human consciousness on this pathway, a song from the plants is given. And it's actually the frequency of that song that then holds the codex to help other people heal that part of their own consciousness. And so as someone who naturally had a gift towards sound, when I was in the process of healing myself, these songs started coming through and then they become these living transmissions where they heal you and then they become alive. And then that aliveness that they live in heals others. So it's this very powerful um, lineage and way of working with song and it really connected me to my true mission on earth here now, which is to sing the songs of remembrance. And um, yeah, so all different layers of how, how we work to heal the voice. And you've come out with albums, right? One or more? Yeah, there's one that's fully produced and then there's another one I'm gonna be releasing this summer. I remember you saying that you, so you're in Alabama, this is where you grew up, and that you went back to your childhood church, right, yes. to record it. Mm -hmm. What was that experience like? Oh my gosh, it was so amazing. And actually the album that I'm recording now, I'm recording in a church too. Um, it was so cool. So I ha I received this vision in, in my final ceremony um, that I was sitting in several years ago, my last trip to Peru. And I was asking at that time to have clarity about my service and how I could take all this medicine I'd received and bring it back to, to this world. And, uh, and I just received a vision of sitting in St. Luke's Church in Birmingham, Alabama and singing these indigenous Icaros from the Amazon. And the message I received at that time was, Jane, if you will follow this call, you will not believe the support that is available to you. It's going to be beyond your wildest dreams. And so I did, and I contacted the music director, this beautiful man named Sean, and I told him the whole story. And I told him about the Ecros of Christ and, and Magdalene and this whole lineage and this tree of light. And, <laughs> and he just said, let's do it, you know? And it was so amazing. And we sat there in the, on the, 
the pulpit, essentially the altar of this Episcopal church in Alabama and just channeled these song frequencies. In. And he, we recorded them actually all in one night um, in this mm. church. So it was incredibly special, incredibly special. Yeah. And I, I'll just say this, this too, you know, I'm, I'm working, recording this album in a different church now. And it's so curious to me how, <clears throat> how um, all of this just wants to be woven back together, you know, and just like all the medicine from, from all of these wisdom keepers I've learned from, they just, it wants to be woven back into the church. It wants to be woven back and it wants to release Christianity from all of these distortions that we've been holding on to. And so I, um, I also feel really deeply connected to that about how we use sacred sound and how we use the frequency of the true voice to release the distortions of, of Christianity and restore it to its initial and original, its own lineage. Yeah. I had a visual of you there and it was like that the codes or the emanation of the voice from that church. And I mean, churches are like antennas, it's like going out and it's the grid, you know, that sending it out from the grid from this place where you grew up. So the ripple of that is so beautiful. Mm, thank you. Oh. <laughs> also a lot in my work, it comes up with women healing the Christian programming. And I... I work a lot with Yeshua and Magdalene and really fully see them as beings of light, beings who were able to reach enlightenment in their lifetimes and to be a light in a really, really dark time. And um, yeah, a lot of healing, especially around sexuality with women that I've been doing and, and reclaiming just the sacredness of their womb space and their um their sexuality and releasing shame and punishment and that type of programming and i use mm -hmm. tapping so we often will go in and we'll be using the eft to just like remind these younger parts of ourselves that okay like this goes back a long time ago to the patriarchy to this time of darkness where the man took power away from the women they felt threatened they there was too much mystery there was they wanted to pull back that power that you know women could create life in their body it was very mysterious they didn't understand it it was threatening to men and so they're taking the power back and and the repression and the suppression that happened to women in the years after and the women being taken out of the bible and all of that very difficult hard times but I truly believe like we're here to heal and reclaim, um, you know, this path, sacred feminine right now in this time as the union with the masculine and to restore that balance. Um, yeah. Anything you want to speak to around that or just Magdalene and anything. Yeah. And thank you for doing that work and, and really just honoring all the women out there who are, having the courage to, first of all, restore these templates inside themselves, to go through the journey of what it really means to restore the sacredness of the womb and the sovereignty of the womb and the power of creation that we hold in our bodies. You know, it is, it is actually scary to think about how much power we have and of how much power we have of creation. And so for, for everyone going on that journey to restore that is it's a really a warrior's path in its own right um and for me um you know one of the the beings who comes to me quite a bit um is sarah tamar and and joan of arc and both of them and the way that they held those grail lines and they took the the holiness of the inner union of their bodies right balancing this masculine and feminine inside themselves and learning how to hold the codex for androgyny, for inner union of masculine and feminine, and then use it to speak the voice of that, which is whole and holy into the world. And, 
you know, it's funny because I have so many women in my life who I would consider to be Magdalene's, like just so many. And whenever I'm going through a crucifixion moment, they seem to arrive at my doorstep and they just love me and they pet me. And it's funny because I, 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 of all of the pieces of that mythology, I think I identify with Magdalene the least, which is curious to me. I, I've never really quite understood it. And she works with me and I work with her and I love her so much, but I really identify more with the, the I really identify so much with Christ. And, and I really identify so much with the templating of the wholeness of the masculine and feminine. You know, um, when Sarah first started coming to me, I was like, you, I get I get you, <laughs> you know, and the way she holds the, the promise of what happens when masculine and feminine unite is what feels so deeply true for me. Mm. And Sarah being the divine child yeah. of Christ and Magdalene. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. I'd love to hear because I know you've studied with so many indigenous cultures, just what your understanding is of where we're headed as a species, as humanity, what is happening right now? How do we make, if there's anyone out there listening, like how do we make sense of COVID and just like all the changes we're seeing on our planet right now and climate change? And how do you find, how do you find peace within that? And what is your understanding of where we're headed? Mm. That is such a beautiful question. Thank you. So I've had to collapse out so many distorted narratives living inside me in order to reach this perspective I'm currently holding with it. And I'm going to also hold that there might be a deeper and wider perspective that I don't currently embody or see. <clears throat> One thing that I have chosen to come back to again and again and again is this belief that I either believe that this is a beautiful and benevolent and whole universe, or I don't. And if I believe that this is a beautiful and benefic whole universe held by the living light of the one, then the only story line is wholeness and the only storyline is a return to that wholeness expressed through the physical body and expressed through the physical dimensions and the way i perceive where we are right now is deeply connected to awarenesses of the yugas from the vedic traditions and quantum physics and the big bang <laughs> and all of these different ways that we describe the story that starts in the garden of eden and goes all the way to the deepest points of fragmentation and separation until the fragmentation and separation is so unbearable that the only decision that's possible is for us to return back to the one. And what I have been feeling in the last year inside myself um, and in the world around us is that there are those of us who are on the leading edge of that return, the return to the one. And so we're feeling it more inside ourselves and have been probably since the 60s. But that collectively we're at that that outer edge of the fragmentation and separation where we're just so dissociated from ourselves and, and from life that we're in deep pain. But I do believe that there is only one story, which is that at some point in that journey of separation and fragmentation, we stop and we turn inward and we begin to hear the call of the mystery calling us home to ourselves. So I get challenged with that perspective a lot, you know, and in fact, just in the last week, I noticed some remnants of patriarchal Christianity living in me, this deep fear that there's something terribly wrong 
happening. And, and I, um, I was working with it and processing it and working with it. And all of a sudden I heard this voice and it said, oh, okay, so we're back to the question again. You, you actually don't believe this is a benevolent universe. And I was like, no, 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 I totally believe it's a benevolent universe, but look at all the darkness, look at all the horrible, look at the matrix, it's so awful. And the voice said, oh, so you don't believe it's a beautiful and benefic universe. And I was so humbled because I was like, there it is again, just those, those parts of me that are separated from the wholeness. Um, and so I went to bed and I was putting myself to bed and I heard the Buddha laughing, <laughs> just like man, what a journey it is to be here, to keep coming back to that wholeness, to keep remembering and choosing it at every turn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I feel into something similar that as earth consciousness is expanding and contracting and over these millennia really of like, going into dark, great darkness and then coming back into wholeness. And I don't know exactly why it's happening. Maybe it was just um, this divine play that we decided that maybe it was boring being totally whole all the time. <laughs> and that we thought, well, maybe let's forget for a little while and, and then return again because of how good it feels to come back into that wholeness and that remembrance. Um. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these are just deep questions I sit with and I like to hear everyone's perspective. <laughs> yeah. uh, I would love to hear um, now having lived so many experiences, what words of wisdom you would have spoken to that self that was struggling and in a lot of pain and going to the IVF and in the relationship because I imagine there are probably people right now, even listening to this, who are like, I'm in that place. I am in so much pain. I don't know where to turn. What would you say to your younger self or to anyone out there who might be in that struggle? I think I would share that there is unbelievable amounts of light and aliveness and beauty and goodness waiting for you. And though the return to our true selves is deeply painful and really confronting, every time I've made it through another death portal back into the light of my own being, I'm better and I'm more connected and I'm more deeply connected to my other human beings and I'm more of service and I'm more alive and um, it gets better and better and better and better. And I could never, six years ago when I was making those decisions, I could never have imagined sitting here in this moment and I think it's important to always say that I am not special. There is nothing special about me. There is nothing in my life story, in the seed of my soul, in the code of what I am that is not you. You have the capacity to be anything your heart deeply longs for. What is calling you forward is calling you. And all you have to do is choose to listen to that still small voice over all else. It will not lead you astray. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. hmm. Any wisdom on little steps to take to start listening to our intuition? Mm. Let me think back on what I started doing at that time in my life. Gosh, there's been so many layers. 
You know, one of the first places that that really opened for me in the early years of my journey was my dreams. Mm. And I love dreams. I'm definitely a dreamer. And I, I often, when I start working with people early in the, in the journey, invite them to become aware of their dreams. And even if they have no idea what it means, just to start to notice some of the themes and archetypes and emotions that start to arise in the dream space, if you're a dreamer. That was a really supportive process for me because I could start to see where I was struggling or longing or in conflict inside myself. And just beginning to tune back to my own wisdom in that way was really supportive. Um, at this point in my life, my body is a really powerful way to connect to my intuition. But I have to be honest that it's taken a lot of years of trauma work and somatic work to really be able to fully trust the body as it's designed to be trusted. And one of the biggest questions people have is, well, is it fear? Is it my intuition? Mm -hmm. And that comes because we're so separated from the intelligence of the body. So for me, dreams were really helpful. And then my creativity has been a really powerful portal to connect to my inner wisdom. And at every part of the journey, it keeps up leveling itself. But even at the very beginning, you know, I just started writing poems and I started journaling and I started the act of allowing that inner voice to speak itself allowing it to say what it wants to say without mitigation um, and giving it a voice to channel in that way is a powerful way to begin to, to begin to connect back in to the fact that you do actually have an inner voice and it actually does have things it wants to say to you. Yeah. And feeling safe in the body again, like you said, you know, it makes sense if we start to leave our body in those times of trauma and to come back in and make, sh you know, creating a, a space of safety where we're going to be listening and attuning and seeing what our inner selves, our younger selves really need mm -hmm. can always help with that. And then also Ah, not avoiding the pain because I think for me that was really like what took me out of my body and disconnected me from my intuition was like oh there's too much physical pain even just being held in the body so finding tools you know whether it's if it's physical pain maybe it's yoga or something like that if it's emotional pain finding tools and resources where you can sit with that and mm -hmm. open to it and love it because mm -hmm. that intuitive it really rises like underneath. It's like the gift underneath when we start to face what's, what's there and inside. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And one thing I really, I really relate to what you're sharing of just, gosh, for me too, the pain can just be so dissociative. Right. And I think one of the other big dissociations we have on the planet is that the intuition comes from somewhere other than the body. Right. Because one thing I've learned on my journey is as I reconnect back into the body, that the actual physical nervous system is the intuitive capacity. It's like this octopus with all of these tentacles sensing and receiving and giving out information. And um, you know, one of the things Richard Rudd talks about in the gene keys, um, especially gene key 19, which is one of my significant keys, is this idea that the actual language of Gaia isn't auditory, it's sensory. Mm. And that as we evolve, we will return to this very like sensory communication. Um, and so restoring our capacity to be inside the body is restoring our intuitive nature. Mm hmm it makes me think of um, cranial sacral therapy and yes. the things that relax the nervous system and sound healing too, the vibrations. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, well, I also just wanted to ask you about your work with death. And it seems like a lot of 
your own death portals of releasing and surrendering parts of yourself has been a big part of your journey, but also maybe holding space for people who actually are passing, leaving their bodies. What has that work been like for you? What have you learned about just facing your own death and how does that shift how you live? Yeah, I really feel so humbled by death and I never thought that this was going to be part of my path. (laughs) I don't think we wake up one day we're like, oh, let me be a death worker, you know? Um, Wow. So much of the work that I, I would say the majority of the work that I do is more about holding space for people to go through consciousness deaths, right? The the deaths that I've already spoken about, what it looks like to truly die to a life that we were living inside of and allow the consciousness and the human body to restructure, Um, you know, both in, in kind of waking work and then in psychedelic work, which is deeply connected to the realms of death. And I have had... And currently I'm meeting with a new client on Thursday who's about to die and holding space for her to come face to face with what it's going to look like to actually cross the portals. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a liminal dimensional space that the soul travels through between being embodied in the third dimensional body and then returning to the greater consciousness and looking at it right straight up close, um, it, it shatters me. Every time I have to face it, it just shatters my heart wide open. And there are many times that I wonder how open I can stay to the experience of death. It's a real practice, you know? And again, this can be the practice of staying truly open to the heartache of a beloved pet passing or staying truly open to the heart shattering of a relationship ending. These are as powerful death portals when we really stay open to them as physically dying. And so I continue to be humbled by death it requires me to, to do so much nervous system work to stay open to it. Um, but I also know that death is an illusion. And whether it's an illusion in your life transformational journey or whether it's an illusion that the consciousness goes anywhere other than back to source to be recycled, is it's all an illusion. So I hold that as I do this work too, that if we can just remember who we truly are and what we truly are, it's easier to let go. Easier to live too. Mm -hmm. Realizing the impermanence. But yeah. I wonder if you'd be open to, well, First, I'll just ask like what offerings, if any, you have coming up that you'd like to share with the people listening. Um, and then I'm, I'm curious if you'd be open to sharing a song and just like so many pieces of wisdom have been shared and just for people to get to actually receive those codes that you carry, um, I think would be really nourishing. Sure, sure. I'll have to see what wants to be shared. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm getting ready to actually take a bit of a break from work. I'm getting ready to go travel and see some soul family and take a little break. But I do have a new album of music that's going to be coming out in probably late June. And I am so excited to share that. So if people go to my website, there are places they can enter their email addresses and I'll send you some sound medicine in the meantime, and then you'll get notified when that album is ready to be released. And then I'm currently teaching a class called The Holy Voice, which is um, an eight-week journey to support 
healers and creatives and visionaries and mothers and really humans of all kinds in the journey to inner union. And then having that journey to inner union support their creative expression, support their voices in the world. So we're about to finish that next week and then I'll be teaching another cohort of that in August. So if that's something that is speaking to someone's soul, they can email me or find more information on the website and make sure they're signed up for when the doors open next time. Beautiful. And we'll include links in the, in the show notes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So let's see who wants to come play today. Mm. I'm just going to open the field and we're going to just let whoever wants to sing through will probably be the great mother. I'm just going to let her sing through. I might just take one second and grab a bowl. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. Wow. Is there anything you want to share about that piece? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's just channeled through. These songs just channel through in the moment. So whoever is listening to this recording, that was for you from the Great Spirit directly into this moment. And... I often have no idea what they are, who and what they're for. <laughs> mm. Okay. Mm. <laughs> well, I'd love to just take all this energy and just like bring it into our hearts. Mm. Just with feeling all the gratitude of getting to, to finally connect today and to come together and Gratitude for everyone listening and taking this time to be in the depth of these deeper questions. 
Just honoring each of us for being on this very brave path of being human mm-hmm. <laughs> and taking on <laughs> this life and um, choosing to be here and doing the work of healing our ancestors and listening to the deep call of our hearts and our inner guidance and all the courage that it takes to say yes to that and all the layers we continue to meet on that path, just holding it all here in our hearts. May we continue to surrender, to offer up the places that are no longer serving, even if it's scary, to trust that there's more opportunity and possibility and alignment on the other side of that. Thank you for sharing your voice with us today, Jane, and for just being the light that you shine in the world. May this wisdom ripple out to all the people who need it. Many blessings. Blessed be. Namaste. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you. liked it share it with a friend or leave us a review on itunes you can also follow along on instagram at rising woman leaders and sign up for email updates at risingwomanleaders.com to be sure to receive all the new and inspiring content thanks again for being here it's an honor to walk this path with you